Because people, when they hear Israel and they think Israel, for når folk hører om Israel og de tænker på Israel, they think of a conflict. They think of bombs. They think tænker på bomber og tænker på konflikten. Of, of barbed wire. Da tænker på pigtråd. Of of suffering people of bullets. Kuler og lidende barn. And no matter what you do, in terms of explaining where the origins of this perception. Come from and who is right and who is wrong. Forklare bakgrund for konflikten og hvem som har ret og hvem som har fejl. Somehow, if people can't break through this mental image, hvis ikke folk kan bryde gennem det her mentale billede, to see the reality of our lives, og se realiteten av vores liv, and what kind of a culture and a society, og hvilken kultur og hvilket samfund vi har, a beautiful culture and society. En vacker kultur, et vackert samfund, which is in the process of working hard to save our planet. Som är en process som jobbar hårt för att berga denna planeten. Without this kind of 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 uh, advocacy of 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 messaging, I think we will not reach our full potential. Så vi ska vi kan vara flinkt nog till att få fram detta budskap så så tror jag att vi kan nå vårt fulla potential. Of the of the work that we have. I det arbete vi har. So. I have been here in Norway as a guest of the ambassador and his wife uh, Eleanor. To talk about Israel's innovation culture. For us not om den israelske innovationskulturen. You know now that Israel leads the world together with the United States. In innovation and startups. Israel is the world leader together with the USA in innovation and startup, so upstart companies. If you look around the world today and you say, where is the next technology or the next cool thing going to come from? If you see something in the world and say, where comes the next cool thing from? It's going to come from Silicon Valley in near San Francisco. So comes it to come either from Silicon Valley in San Francisco and Silicon Wadi or Silicon Valley in Israel. And Silicon Valley in Israel. Okay, in other words, literally, the, the world is bipolar in this way. What net is on bipolar so? Between the two great powers. Mitt med de de två stora de två stora supermakter. In 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 innovation, who are working together. Så jobba samman in en innovation. And that's what I've been talking about is how this partnership works. Today, for example. Så det är det jag ska om nu. Hur den detta partnerskapet fungerar. Idag, för exempel. Yeah, I'm going to. Go uh, here. <clears throat> Let's get this up and running. Can we get this uh, to? I don't speak Norwegian, so if we could get a slideshow here, Let's, you know what? Here, uh, I, I see the slideshow there. Ah, okay. So all of these companies. All of these are Are American companies. All of these are American companies. Big companies that you use their products every day in your life. Store selskap, og du bruger så sikkert hvis disse produkter hver dag i dit liv. Except how many of you know that the chip that's in this computer or in your computer at home from Intel? Hvor mange dog ved at den chip som findes inde i denne PC'en her eller i PC'en du er hjemme fra Intel? Whose name is Centrino or Pentium? The name is the Centrino or the Pentium. Its real name in Hebrew is Merom or Banias. The Hebrew name is Merom, or Banias. Banias. These are its first name. The chips were designed in Israel. These are chips on what they sign up in Israel. Okay, eight thousand employees work for Intel doing chip design. The eight thousand employees in Intel work in Israel. So you have a chip design. So much activity goes on for Intel in Israel. So much activity is shared with Intel in Israel. That their advertising slogan should be Israel inside. Israel inside. Okay, it's just it's just that important, but it not just Intel. It's Cisco Systems, which is the company that powers the internet. Cisco Systems, the company that that makes the power to the internet. Just made their thirteenth purchase of an Israeli company. They have made their thirteenth purchase of an Israeli company. They spent five billion dollars. They have spent five billion dollars. To buy Jerusalem's largest employer of high-tech workers. For to buy Jerusalem's largest employer of high-technology workers. This is a very interesting story because the company, which was called NDS or News Datacom Systems, it had a very interesting story. The same company was called for NDS. Yes, News Datacom. Yeah, news, news, daily news. 
was uh, built at a university called Mahon Lev or the Jerusalem College of Technology. Uh, they come from the Jerusalem College of Technology, which is an unusual institution. Som en en usedvanlig institution. Because in the morning you study Talmud. För på morgonen så studerar de Talmud. You study traditional Jewish also, religious texts. Traditionella judiska texter. And then in the afternoon you learn to write software code. Och på eftermiddagen så lärde de att skriva programvara koder. Now these people came from this group and they built a technology to control access to satellite transmissions. Ja, de kom från det som kom från den gruppen här. De har byggt teknologi för att och kontrollera tillgång till satellitteknologi. It was called conditional access. Det behövde alltså um, allmänlig tillgång. Yes, conditional access. And this this technology became critical to a very interesting businessman named Rupert Murdoch. Och det här den teknologin blev svårt det sång för en känd businessman som heter Rupert Murdoch. Who decided that he needed this technology to power his worldwide satellite TV empire. Han trodde att han trängde den teknologin för att ge kraft till So in 1992 he bought this company from these 15 Talmud students computer programmers. Så tidigt på 90-talet köpte han då det där sällskapet från dessa var det 15 15. And he paid 15 million dollars, 1 million dollar per head. Fair price. Han betalade 15 miljoner dollar för det, 1 miljon dollar per hode. Okay, now uh, those people who I know, they're my friends, were ecstatic, were happy. This was a great event. Except Rupert got happier. Because 20 years later, he sold that company for five billion dollars. And but what's incredible about it is that today it employs in det, Jerusalem 1,500 people. Idag är det 1,500 ansatte i Jerusalem i det sällskapet. So you can see the growth in 20 years from 15 employees to 1,500. Det växer på 20 år från 15 till 1,500 ansatte. This is the power of our technology revolution. Det är kraften i vår teknologi revolution. And it's not just Rupert Murdoch or Microsoft, or Facebook, or IBM, or Google, or Mr. Warren Buffett from Berkshire Hathaway, who made his first major investment outside of the US in Israel. These are all companies that have been buying Israeli companies. There are 300 multinationals now that have moved into Israel. Det är alltså över 300 multinationella sällskap som nu har flyttat in till Israel. And what they're doing is they are sourcing the products which you and I use every day of our lives. Och det de gör är att de framskaffar de produkter som jag och du brukar varje dag i våra liv. And and so whether it's this little disk which we used now. Så nu så så vi snackar om nu den lilla disken som vi har här. That was invented in Israel by M Systems. Det var uppfinner i Israel av M Systems. Your instant messaging, which your children use like crazy. Ja, messaging, för exempel, ja, MSN och sånt där. Yeah, the average American, by the way, teenager, is now sending 100 messages every day. Ja, den den genomsnittliga tenåringen i USA har sänt nu hundra sådana meddelningar varje dag. You can either thank or curse Israel for this. Du kan inte förbanna Israel för det. Now. But it's not just this, it's voice over IP, the technology that we all use on Skype. Inte bara detta, men också voice, alltså stämme over IP. Invented in Israel. Skype, för exempel, det är också uppfunnit i Israel. If you use Microsoft Xbox with the new Kinect, where you can communicate with the game with your hands. Det är som du brukar Microsoft Xbox, den sista versionen. Invented in Israel by PrimeSense. Uppfunnit i Israel. If you have a security program on your computer that is an antivirus, if you have an antivirus program on your PC, it might have come to you from a company called Norton or McAfee. So the sound is coming from a company called Norton or McAfee. Good American names. Good American names. Except that the people who wrote the software are named Yoram and Yosef. What's the fact that the names of the software are Yoram and Yosef? Okay. Um, if you look at 
uh, uh, the firewall, which is a very critical piece of technology. Det på brandmur, alltså det säkerhetsinstallation som finns i Which is used to protect networks from hackers, yeah. from bad people. Det för att beskytta nätverk för exempel. This was developed by Checkpoint. Okay. Checkpoint. Checkpoint. Today, for example, the mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barakat, who's the mayor. Ja, ordförande i Jerusalem. He was the investor. Han var, checkpoint. han var en investor i Checkpoint. He gave the company uh, back in 1991 $500,000. Han gav i 1991 $500,000. As a loan. Som ett lån. And they agreed to pay back the loan and he would get 50% of the company. Och, och de betalade tillbaka lånet för att han fick 50% av sällskapet. The company today is worth 14 billion dollars. Idag är det sällskapet värt 14 miljarder dollar. So we now have a mayor in Jerusalem who doesn't need a salary. Så vi har nu en ordförande i Jerusalem som tränger inte lön. And this is what is going on today in det Israel for example. Idag. Uh, there, and there are stories of miracles too that we see miracles in front of our eyes. Vi ser miraklar framför våra ögon ständigt. Especially in the medical area. Speciellt inom det medicinska området. Now, have you heard the story of rewalk yet? Så har du hört då historien om om rewalk alltså gå på nytt igen. If you have a member of your family who is a paraplegic, God forbid. Som en paraplegic. How do you translate paraplegic? Someone who is in a wheelchair right. can't so, use their lam, legs. Not quad, not four, no, just the lam, legs. Lam, there are millions of people in the world, unfortunately, who can't walk. So there is a company now in Israel called ReWalk who have made an exoskeleton It's, it's a piece of equipment which you put on and you walk again. A person who, and it's by the way, it's not a million dollars. It's $70,000 today and the price is dropping. And just recently there was a paraplegic who, who walked with this device the entire length of the London Marathon. Det var en person en lång person som gick i samma distans som London Marathon med hjälp av detta utstyr. But it's it goes on and on. I mean for example today in Africa. For example idag i Afrika. We know that AIDS is the major killer. Vi vet att AIDS är den viktigaste dödsorsaken i Afrika. And yet we now know that circumcision Och vet också att omskäring will reduce the transmission of AIDS by 80% or more. And yet, there is no way to take enough doctors or Jewish rabbis to circumcise all the men in Africa. It doesn't work. But there is a new Israeli company who's made a little ring Som har lagt en liten ring. Which you put, it's not so little, it's good size. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and this ring, Och den ringen, in six days, sex dagar, no blood, ingen blod, no surgery, ingen kirurgi, you are circumcised. Men då är du and this is now being bought by millions, Och, in millions of quantity by African countries to stop AIDS. Av afrikanska land nu, eh, alltså, av olika afrikanska land, för att stansa AIDS. Now you look at what happened in Haiti. In Haiti. When the earthquake, terrible earthquake happened. There were primarily two countries in the world who rushed in. To save lives. One was the United States of America, which is right next to Haiti. But the second most important country was Israel, who sent 300 people who had their hospital established in Haiti even two weeks before the United States was up and running. Now, you ask, you ask if I say, how is it possible that Israel could have 300 people there in a hospital before the U.S. And the answer is that we like to break rules sometimes. 
Because our people, they said, well, you need landing permits and you need to do this study and that study. And our people said, no way. We're going in, we're saving lives, ja. we're setting up a hospital ja. now. Ja, för våra folk, vi ser bara att vi kan inte vänta på tillåtelse, vi bara går in och vi bara går liv. So, but it's not just in the medical area. Men det är inte bara på det medicinska området. It's in the area of environment and saving the, the planet from pollution. Men också i miljöteknologi, när det gäller att rädda planeten vår. So, for example, today, för example and, idag, and it's hard for you to understand this in Norway, where you are blessed with abundant water. But there are many countries of the world where they don't have water for drinking. And children die in the millions from drinking polluted water. And today Israel leads the world in water technology. Whether it's systems that will take polluted water and turn it into clean drinking water. A system that, for example, looks like a water cooler that sits in the middle of an African village and takes moisture from the air, powered by solar energy, and gives you every day a hundred clean liters of drinking water. Or it's the fact that we are drinking now from Israel at the end of next year a majority of our drinking water from the sea. The next part of our drinking water comes from the Middelhavet. And the fact that we've invented a drip irrigation. But we also open a drop system. Where instead of just going, but instead of going, but instead of going, so it comes so for the next one it's a drop. So that you can grow. Plants and food in countries which don't have water, that are deserts. There are even new products that are simple pieces of plastic that have been designed to sit in a desert area next to a plant, and they take the dew that God gives in the atmosphere and puts that dew on the plant so that it can grow. Och få den ner till planten så att de kan växa. So when someone talks about boycotting Israel, so no no no, it's not boycott Israel. So are they talking about stop stopping us from solving AIDS? So då vi snakkar egentligen om att stopp stansa oss från att och lösa AIDS. Or stopping us from making people walk again? Eller stansa oss från att hjälpa folk att lämna folk att gå? Or stopping us from creating drinking water. What are they talking about? There is a spectacular article which you should read in a website called israel21c.org. Israel21c.org. Org. And it's called 65 ways that Israel is saving the planet. Och det heter 65 måter som Israel bergar planeten which is just a small sample of so many of these stories that you'll never see in the Norwegian press. Or you'll never see them in the US press. Or you won't see them in the German or the Japanese press because the press isn't interested in these stories. The, the press wants to talk about the conflict. But it's our job to focus them on these stories so they can see that there is a reality behind Israel that is not just a conflict, that it's about a people who have come home after 2,000 years of exile in a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and who are now working together with its friends to save the planet. And so the work that you do is just so valuable to us. I'd like to share some other stories with you about, about our people. And one of the questions which needs to be asked. I don't have time for all these slides. You'll excuse me. Is why 
has this happened in Israel? Why has there been this tremendous growth of innovation technologies and of new companies and of things that are happening that will, will, that will really change all of our lives? And the answer relates primarily to our attitude towards risk. Because in many parts of the world, risk is a very bad word. What we call a four-letter word. It's a curse word. Risk is bad. Except that in Israel, we have no choice. We live with existential risk. Vi lever med existentiell risiko hela tiden. We wake up every morning. Vi vaknar upp varje morgon. And listen to a president madman in Tehran. Och lyssnar till president galning i Tehran. Who says he is going to wipe us out? Som säger att han ska viska oss ut för korta. But he doesn't just talk. Men han snakkar inte bara. He's working to get the means to do so. Han jobbar för att få medlen till att göra detta. And while there are many great Leaders who are trying to stop him, such as the President of the United States. Thank God. The 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 President Obama. We are we are still afraid that he might succeed. So I'm still afraid for that the Iranian president will succeed. And yet, even with that great risk, and even with that great risk, we don't stop creating. We don't stop creating. So stop because we don't stop creating. It's not about the fact that. You have risk. Risk is part of life. Also, risk is a part of our life. But it's how do you respond to it? So, the challenge is how do you respond to it? And what we do is we build companies. We create things. We do. We start a startup. We create things. And if you look at Jewish history, if you look at Jewish history, this has been the way it's always been. This is the way we've always done it. There is a joke in the Jewish people about how do you define a Jewish holiday. There is a joke about how do you define a Jewish holiday. They tried to kill us. They tried to kill us. They did not succeed. They didn't succeed. Now let's eat. Now let's eat. Now let's eat. And what this joke tells you is that whether it was Pharaoh, the Pharaoh in the time of Egypt, or the Romans, or the Inquisition, or it was Hitler, they tried to destroy us, but they did not succeed. And we are still here creating all of this Miracles. Together with our friends. Together with our friends. In Israel, everybody who lives there has stories. All the people who live there have their own stories about their friends and their family. About friends and family. Who the worst things have happened to. Who have lived the worst things have happened to. And there is nobody in Israel. And there is nobody in Israel. And there is nobody in Israel. Doesn't have this experience in their family. So, Mika had that type of experience in his family. And it's not just the experience of the Holocaust. It's not just about the experience of the Holocaust. Or the experience of the losses in wars. Or the top or terror. But it's it's part of our lives. But it's part of our lives. And I will I will tell you one or two stories now, and not to tell you what happened, but to tell you how the families. Responded. For the first time, it has been how these families have responded to what has happened. So, my my son Moshe or Momo. My son Moshe. His nickname is Momo. Momo. Has been when he was a 16-year-old. He was a volunteer for Magen David Adom, which is the Israeli version of the Red Cross. Yeah. Then, when he was 16 years old, he was a volunteer for Magen David Adom, which is the Israeli version of the Red Cross. Yeah. Then, when he was 16 years old, he was a volunteer for Magen David Adom, which is the Israeli version of the Red Cross. Yeah. Then, when he was 16 years old, he was a volunteer one night, this was in 2000, and I think it was four or five. I can't remember exactly. During the intifada, we heard a loud bomb go off in our house. And I live in Jerusalem, and I heard many bombs. And what you do is there's almost a routine that you go through. The first thing is you listen. 
to för, hear if there are ambulances. Först gör att du lyssnar för att höra om det är ambulanser som kommer. And then if you hear the ambulances, you know it was a bomb. Och visst visst du hör ambulanser, då skönar du att det var en bomb. And the next thing you do is you then take your cell phone. Nästa du gör det att du tar upp mobiltelefonen din. And you start calling your children. Och så ring du till barnen dina. To make sure that everybody's okay. För för att försäkra dig om att alla har det bra. And you start from the youngest up to the oldest. Och du startar gärna med den yngsta och så ringer du upp till den äldsta. And so my daughter was okay, Nina. Min dotter var det bra. My son Itamar was okay. Min son Itamar han var okay. My son Mom, uh, son Yossi was okay. Min son Yossi var okay. And Momo I could not find. Men jag fick inte tag i Momo. No answer. Ingen han tog inte telefon. And at which point I start to get worried. Och då började jag bli bekymrad. I go out of the house and go towards the bomb. Jag gick ut av huset, flög ut och gick i riktning där bomben gick av. And when I got close to the street, this was. Uh, my I live in the German colony of Jerusalem this is Emek Raphaim I saw my son who was wearing a white t-shirt filled with blood and I was ready to collapse and to faint because I thought something had happened to him and I went and I grabbed him and I said son are you okay and he said I'm fine I was helping Och så jag har det bra. Jag har varit och jobbat till. Because he was one block away from the bomb. Han var ett kvartal unna då bomben gick av. When it went off. Då det gick av. And again, he had been trained as a uh, a volunteer for the Red Cross. Och han har blivit uh, tränad upp av som en frivillig av uh, den röda davidsstjärnan. So as soon as it went off, he ran to go help. Så med en gång går han då och så sprang han till the site. för att hjälpa människor och evakuera folk från. And that's why he had blood on his. Det var därför han hade blod på skjortan sin. So we went home and we curled up with the dog. And I was very upset about why we have to live that way. With my 16-year-old has to take people who have been blown up in a bomb. Och vi kunde min 16-åring bli gutt mot att fara och ta undan människor som var blivit blåst i fillet. But what was bad got much worse in a few hours later. Men det som var illa blev mycket värre i löpande få timmar. Because we got a call that told us that a friend of ours named Dr. David Applebaum who was an emergency medical doctor and was responsible for always being the first person on the scene of every one of these bombs. He had been asked by the medical center at Ground Zero in New York Han hade blivit inviterad av det medicinska centret där Ground Zero i New York. To go and help them with software which he had built to help triage terror victims. Och hjälpa dem med software, alltså dataplan för att hjälpa terroroffer. And he said, no, I can't because my daughter is getting married. Och han sa, jag kan inte det för min dotter ska gifta. But they convinced him that he would be back in time for the marriage. Men de övertalade honom att han skulle vara tillbaka i tid. And so he went to Ground Zero. Så de gick till Ground Zero. Gav dem software and then he flew back to Jerusalem. He came straight from the airport to his home and he took his daughter Nava who was going to be married the next day and said Nava we must have a father-daughter talk at the cafe. And David and Nava were walking into Cafe Hillel when the bomb went off. And the two of them were killed. And so the next day, instead of going to the wedding, we all went to the funeral. And we've all been to very, very horrible funerals in this country. But there was never a funeral like this. And you would think that as a result of this tragedy, Om man skulle tro att som ett resultat av en sån tragedia, it would destroy the family beyond repair. Så vill det vill familjen bli ödelagt fullständigt och that it would destroy the community. Att vill ödelägga samfunnet. That you basically get so angry at God. Att du blir så sint på Gud. And say, how can you do this? Och se hur då kan du göra detta? Not just the horror of taking a father and a daughter the night before her wedding. Inte bara skräcken över att att en far och dotter bedrägt. But one of the the really great heroes of, of our people. So 
What's interesting about this story is what happened next. Men det är intressant med den historien det är vad som skedde efterpå. And what happened next is that his family och det som skedde efterpå det var att hans familj became completely united in terms of continuing his work. De förenade sig samman eh, om att fortsätta hans arbete. And his sons all rallied around he had a series of medical emergency clinics and, and they f- built them more. Han hade flera som If sometime you're in Israel, you'll see the Terum Clinic, which was built by David Applebaum. It has now become the biggest acute clinic chain in Israel. Terum Clinic is now the biggest acute clinic chain in Israel. And they are now taking this to countries in Africa to build a model of how to do this. So it's now happening in Kenya. And then the friends of the Applebaum said, we must do something. And so we built special fellowships to bring immediately 20 new doctors from America who would make Aliyah, who would come to live in Israel, so that we would tell our enemies that you can take one of our very best but you can't stop us and so 20 came where there was one there were now 20 so the issue is not can you avoid risk can you avoid tragedy because the answer is unfortunately very obvious you cannot Tragedy has been with us since the beginning. But the question is, what do you do with it? How do you respond? What goes on in your, in your insides? How do you get up the next day and what do you do? And so, this is the spirit that has always infused our people. And our country, and our friends, because no matter what people are saying, and what kind of of lies they're telling about us, the reality is far too strong. And if you if you look at the beauty that is Israeli society today, and you look at our role in the world, it, it's these lies simply can't stop us. And the truth will come out. But we as a as a group of friends who are united in support of this miracle in our time must learn to tell the stories of the miracle. We must not fight on the battleground that our enemies have chosen for us. We must take the argument to a different level. To talk about what is good, what is right, what is beautiful, what is positive, and not be caught up in the negative cycle of conflict and violence. Because this is the way that we truly win. And we honor the memory of those who have paid the most serious price. So again, I, I want to again thank you for very much for having me here tonight. It's a great honor. I would be happy to answer your questions. I hope to come back soon again to Oslo. Thank you very much. Um, But that's the beauty of our country is that we can be critical and no one comes at night to take you away and put you in jail or shoots you or shuts you up. So we have many problems. For, and among our problems are that there still are parts of our population who are not wealthy. Poverty is an issue. And in particular, there are two groups who have uh, an oversized role in this poverty story. One are the orthodox, ultra-orthodox Jews who have 
six, eight, ten children som per family. Thank God. Åtta, tio barn per familj. Thank God. And uh, uh, the other group are Arab Israelis. Och andra gruppen det är israeliska araber. And there are reasons for both of these groups being more represented in poverty. Uh, one is that the ultra-orthodox, for example, in many of their schools, they don't learn mathematics or science. Or the, and that the Arabs, for example, don't serve in the army, which serves as a great training ground for many of these jobs in But work is going on to improve the situation in both of these sectors. So that there today thousands and thousands of ultra-Orthodox are now getting this education which they so badly need. And Arab students are increasing very, very dramatically at places like the Technion, which is Israel's MIT or Trondheim. There is a high cost of living in Israel. Men det är väldigt dyrt och lätt. Det höjer levkostnader i Israel. Although after I've seen the prices in Oslo, I, I think that I don't think it's so high anymore. Men det är väldigt dyrt och sen säger jag att det är så dyrt i Israel. But we had a, uh, a series of protests uh, about a year and a half ago during the summer, which started over cottage cheese. Because if many of you have been to Israel and stayed in a hotel, you were served what's called an Israeli breakfast, which is this lavish buffet with hundreds of different dishes. That is a marketing lie. It's not an Israeli breakfast. It's a hotel breakfast. The Israeli breakfast, the classic Israeli breakfast, is a little cottage cheese, tomato, cucumber, and brot. <laughs> okay, that's it. So when the cottage cheese got to be very expensive, so the cottage cheese in the stage, please. It, it was like 12 kroner for a little tin this size. Okay, all of a sudden people said, Genug, enough. Okay, not happening. And so on Facebook, so on Facebook, and Israelis love Facebook, they said, let's boycott inside Israel the cottage cheese. Especially they got angry when they found out that the same cottage cheese for 12 kroner was selling in Europe by the same Israeli company for six kroner. So they started a, a protest, and guess what? It worked. And they brought the price down to six kroner. It works. Now there were 400,000 people in the street of Tel Aviv for these pr protests. That is 5% of the total population. It won protests. I don't know of another country that has had a peaceful protest with 400,000 people in a long time. And while someone might say, look, You have problems. I'd say, look at how beautiful our democracy is. Okay, because people listen, and and the government changed. And so the government actually improved social benefits, raised taxes. Something I don't like, but. I accept the will of the people. And, and again, it's, it's a question of how you see this reality. And so while we, we certainly have problems, I find that what's exciting about being an Israeli is that we embrace them. We argue. We fight. We fight. And then we work. And so this kind of 
of, of, uh, uh, of problems, I think, are a natural part of any society. Så den här typen problem är, men är naturligt i ett vart samfund. Especially a society like Israel, which is so diverse. Speciellt i ett samfund som Israel, som är så uh, forskjellig. And, and, and for example, I, I want to I share something with you. Many of you might think that Israel is monolithic. Många av er tror att Israel är monolitisk. Is, for example, a white country. Ett vitt land. Not true. Nej, det är inte sant. Today, 80% of Israel is Jewish, 20% is not Jewish. Israel, idag så är 80% av israelerna judar, eh, resten inte judar. It's actually 75% Jewish, 5% Uh, halfway and about 20% not. <laughs> but anyway, it's in that range. Okay. Uh, but within the Jews, the majority of the Jews in Israel are from Africa and Asia. We are not a white people. We have hundreds of thousands of Jews from Morocco, from Yemen, from Iran, from Iraq, even from India. We can get good Indian food now in Israel. Uh, we, not just in Oslo. <laughs> uh, we have 100,000 Jews from Bukhara. 100,000 from the Kafkaz, from uh, near Baku, Azerbaijan. Baku, yeah. We have Jews from Georgia, but they're not from Atlanta. <laughs> not from Atlanta. And, and so this diversity is our strength. If you look at the Israeli society, it, it has a huge diversity, both ethnically, color, religious observance, religious observance, Political ideas. Politiska idéer. Okay, um, it's 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 just a, a, a hugely diverse society, and this is a a, th a source of pride. Det är väldigt diversifierat samfund, och det är något som vi är stolta av. So it would be surprising to me if you brought back the Jews after 2,000 years of exile. Jag vill ju varför undra visst det att du brakar tillbaka judar att det from over a hundred different countries on the planet. Hundra forskjellige land på den planeten. And there were no problems. Och så var det inget problem. And the question again is not do you have problems? Spörsmålet är inte har du problem? But what are you doing about it? Spörsmålet vad gör du med det? And I, on that level I feel very comfortable about this. Så på den nivån känner jag mig väldigt komfortabel med situationen. Okej, speaker. <laughs> he said that uh, all the Russians have their own newspapers, right. own television, uh, own menus, and right. you go to the shop, they say Spasiba. That's right. I think it's uh, we are usually bene benefited by the Russian immigration. Um, I am very close friend of a, of a true hero of the Jewish people named uh, Natan Sharansky. He was a fighter for freedom. Who stood up against the evil? that was the Soviet system. And the fact that we got a million Russians who came to our country with all of their skills, whether it was concert pianists and violinists, computer programmers, doctors, researchers in science and even Jewish gymnasts. Okay. This was a great blessing for our country. Now, they are very proud of their Russianness. And they have, like many immigrants, built uh, a culture Och så många immigranter har byggt en egen kultur. But that culture quickly becomes part of the whole. Men den kulturen blir rast en del av det stora hela. And if you look today, you know, 
The first generation of Russians, their names were Ivan, or Spas, or Boris, and today their names are Yaakov, you know, Tomer, and uh, Tal. Okay? I mean, in other words, they have taken modern Hebrew names, they are serving in the army, and they are simply a huge part of our society. Today they're about, you know, they're over 15% of the Jewish population. Uh, when I was young, I, I, I met a, a woman named Sherry. Uh, who, like me, we, I didn't grow up in a particularly uh, traditional Jewish family. I grew up in, a, in a, what's called an assimilated family. And uh, only later in my life did I learn about my Jewish background, Jewish heritage. I, I was born in America, and I came to Israel as a visitor, and then I became engaged. It, it began to speak to me, the, the history and the, the culture and the identity. And when I met Sherry, she was a flower child. You know, term from the 60s. Yeah, uh, was um, a poet, okay, most beautiful, just physically gorgeous, and you know, just had this aura of, of kindness and goodness and happiness about her. And she was the friend of my wife, and she was on the way to India from, from, from America. And she looked at the map and said, I'll oh, stop off and visit you guys in Israel. And she got to Israel, and she never left. Okay, um, she ended up meeting a, a wonderful guy named Seth, uh, who became a rabbi. They both became traditionally observant, and they uh, raised four beautiful children. And they went to live in a village near, I don't like the term settlement, because I think it's wrong, it's a village. Uh, uh, near Jerusalem called Tekoa, which is a uh, village where the prophet Amos used to, to prophesy. And one, uh, her oldest son, Kobe, was 13 years old, had just had his bar mitzvah, and one day, he and his friend Yosef decided to go for a, a, a to, to leave school, you know, to play hooky, and to go for a hike in the valley nearby. And at six o'clock in the afternoon, Sherry began to worry that her son hadn't come home from school. And they sent out people from the village to search for him. And finally, at midnight, they found Kobe and Yosef in a cave where their skulls had been crushed with rocks. And I remember getting a call uh, that invited me to this funeral. Uh, and there was my friend Sherry, beautiful flower child Sherry, throwing herself on the casket of her 13-year-old son who had been killed. Now, again, this should be the end, right? This, this, this kind of thing, when you lose a, a child, would, and not just lose a child, but it, it, he was so badly disfigured that they wouldn't let her see his face afterwards. It was such, and by the way, the murderers have never been found um, to this day. But Seth and Sherry 
picked up and said, okay, we must do something for not just ourselves, but for every other Israeli who has lost someone in the terror. So they built a foundation called the Kobe Mandel Foundation in Kobe's honor. Which to this day organizes summer camp for hundreds of families where the children have lost their brothers and sisters or mothers in this terror. Because they find that these children, when they come together, can release and feel normal. And it turns out that this is a problem that goes beyond the terror. Today, thank God, the number of kids who are suitable for this summer camp from terror is dropping. But there are still parents who die in a car crash, God forbid. Or because of a brother who dies of cancer. And so these children today are together with the terror victims in this camp. With hundreds of children. And, and she's written a book called The Blessing of a Broken Heart. Which is an unbelievable book that basically tells how do you find meaning in this terrible tragedy. And I just look at them and I say, here are people who have taken the worst that life can throw at you and have turned it into something we call in Hebrew Kiddush Hashem, which means sanctification of God's name. That somehow you take the worst and you turn it into the very best. And where this comes from, I don't know. I hope that I am never challenged that way. I hope none of us are ever challenged that way. But it is, it is simply part of who we are. And this is the stories that we carry with us forever. For all time. And it's the, it's the ability to say, let's eat Let's celebrate L'chaim, to life. We say, is because it's about life. It's about, and, and that is the best way to, to defeat our enemies. Look, I, I think that the boycott can be engaged met on the battlefield and defeated. Okay, I think that the boycott is absurd and we simply have to make it absurd. Yeah. And and absurd. Because for example, what you have to tell these, excuse me, idiots who are talking about the boycott, okay, is okay, you're serious about the boycott? Take your computer and smash it. Destroy your cell phone. Never hook up to the internet. Okay, do not ever use Facebook. Don't use Google. Okay, do not take a pill from a generic drug company because Israel leads that. Don't use instant messaging. Uh, don't uh, uh, use an Xbox. Go live in a cave. <laughs> and watch how they respond. And, the, and they can't. Because they, what happens is that it, it is they continue to use lies to call Israel apartheid when we are the indigenous people. Okay, the, we are Afro-Asian. We are not white. How can we be apartheid if we're not white? It doesn't make any sense. The whole thing is crazy. And uh, our problem is that we are timid. 
is that we worry about what we're going to say and how we're going to argue. And it's just we've got to make these people look as ridiculous as they are. Because they are against progress on mankind, they're against saving the planet, against desalination and, and working with water and agriculture and feeding the planet. And if they want to make that case, let them make the case. <laughs> But I'm asking you, what have any of these boycott supporters ever done to help the planet? Show me one invention. Show me one drug. Show me one invention, anything that helps people. Okay, and when they are willing to meet us on that battleground, then I am willing to take them seriously, and that's not about to happen. So that's what I would urge you.